You have found the Lions Injury Podcast for NFL Conference Championship Weekend. My name is Steven Andrus, joined each and every week on this show by Will Carroll. More than 20 years of injury experience, analysis, expert opinion. His article for this week is on the lines.com right now, and it is important because we have a ton of significant names on the depth chart to discuss ahead of the AFC and the NFC Championship game. He's also the author of The Science of Football, available everywhere books are sold right now. Will, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good. And, you know, with uh, The Science of Football, if you've read it, you know, Chapter 7 is where I detailed. I uh, got the chance to see how Patrick Mahomes trains. And it's crazy because there have been so many times where I've watched him this season and I've seen something he did in these crazy things. There's this one game where him and Sam Ellinger, the, the backup quarterback in Indianapolis, were basically running in a figure eight and they cut back and forth and jump and dodge each other. It looked like a kid's game. <laughs> but then I think it was week 13 or 14, uh, he was about to be sacked, and all of a sudden he spun out. And it was exactly that kind of drill. It was that motion. I was like, he practiced this. And some of the other things he practiced are, you know, hopping on one foot, uh, not being able to cut a certain direction, uh, having his shoe fall off, because that apparently happened to him. And he was like, well, I didn't like that. I better be ready for it again. It's that kind of preparation that is going to be so key for him this week. Well, let's talk more about Patrick Mahomes because it is the biggest injury this weekend in the AFC Championship game. The line has been bouncing around because earlier this week, before we had the first practice and him out there, the market was bearish on the Chiefs. Yeah. They made Cincinnati as big as a two and a half point road favorite in this game, far from the departure of the open where this was minus three and got beat down considerably on concerns about Mahomes high ankle sprain while the market was bullish you were bearish you wrote in a separate article of the lines.com that you had confidence that he'd be able to yeah. still pass effectively in this game even if the scrambling ability was taken away explain to us why you thought that considering how bad the injury looked and why high and, and despite how high ankle sprains have been multiple week injuries for other positions yeah, there's a couple things here. First, you have to understand his preparation. As I just said, this is the kind of thing he works around. Uh, the kind of uh, stuff that he does with Bobby Stroop, uh, a bunch of athletes over there. So uh, it shouldn't surprise anybody that uh, this kind of training has given him a good result. It's just the work ethic. The second is the injury itself which he's had a number of high ankle sprains. Obviously, he had one a couple of years ago, struggled through the, the, the end of the playoffs, end of the Super Bowl, just wasn't himself, which is one of the reasons he doubled down on the preparation. But both of his ankles have had this condition before, and they're just a little bit looser than you'd actually want them to be. Um, I'm going to compare this to Steph Curry. Uh, Steph came into the league, and it, he had trouble with the physicals. People are like, these ankles are problematic. That's why he dropped in the draft. Um, however, the, the Warriors kind of made a, a smart pick, understood what they had in him. He ended up having surgery uh, to, to basically tighten up his ankles. Now, it's a different ligament. His is in the anatomical ankle. But Pat's uh, syndesmotic ligament, which is, goes in between the tibia and the fibula, it's not in the ankle. It's above the ankle. And it's stressed when you make lateral moves, especially... Uh, you know, if you're pushing off the inside of your feet, just if you're at home, stand up and, and put the pressure on the inside of your feet, whether you're moving right, whether you're moving left, and you'll just feel that. Those are the ones that are going to stress that ligament. Again, his are a little looser. So when it rolled uh, or when it was forcibly rolled for him, mm -hmm. it didn't do quite as much damage. You know, think about those old socks you have. They're still a little bit stretchy. But, man, you know, they, they're not as tight as they once were. So there wasn't that cellular damage. You know, anytime those ligaments stray, uh, stretch or strain, they, they get little tears in them, uh, you know, even at the cellular level. It's not just a full fiber that can tear. Uh, so his just, it had more give, essentially. 
that means less pain, less inflammation. There wasn't as much inflammation after the game. There wasn't as much inflammation the next day. He went in for the MRI, had a clean MRI, and that was one of the, the real big signs for me because if there a lot of inflammation, the MRI will be unclear. They're like, nope, normal high ankle sprain, able to see it clearly, uh, told me there wasn't a ton of inflammation. So without pain, without inflammation, uh, a little bit of tape, the way you're going to see Rick Burkholder, uh, what, what he did last week. He's the athletic trainer. Uh, they are one of the best. That is a great medical staff. They handled it perfectly. Uh, they haven't had to do, uh, you know, talking to people in Kansas City, they haven't had to do a lot for him. If you saw him Wednesday, if you saw him Thursday, you know, we haven't seen him you know, doing much more than jogging across the field. But I didn't see a limp. Uh, and that's not acting. I think that's him doing what he, he does. And I think we're going to see, you know, I think the floor is an 80% Mahomes. And that's pretty darn good. Yeah, it's 100% better than a lot of other quarterbacks we watched this season. That's for that's for darn sure. So a couple other injuries to hit on here with the Chiefs. Then we'll talk about the Bengals. And then I'll give kind of my betting opinion of, of what's going yeah. on with this game. Uh, Frank Clark on the defensive side, if Chris Jones is the most important player along that front seven, then Frank Clark might be number two. Uh, he seems to be fine with this groin injury, it, it, it appears. Yeah, a little worried because, you know, there were a couple times he came out, uh, you know, looking at his snap count. It's tough to tell if that's, you know, the way the game was playing out or whether they were having him on a pitch count. Uh, but he, he looked pretty good. I, I always worry about groin strains. You know, these guys are likely to go past the point uh, they probably should. It's very tough to play uh, dialed back uh, in a game as big as this, the adrenaline running. Uh, but everything looks pretty good for Clark. I mean, it's just in the back of my mind that you have to think there's some risk he comes out early. Nicole Hardman went from three DNPs and an out designation last week to now limited practices and back-to-back days Wednesday and Thursday. We are recording Friday morning, so we don't know the full injury report at this point. But um, to be honest with you, Will, even if he plays, I can't imagine he's going to have a significant role at this point in the offense considering how many weeks he's been out. Yeah, as much as he's going to do is he's going to be, I don't want to say a decoy, but he's going to be kind of like Jamison Williams was in those first couple of games when he was back from his knee injury. Um, he is a deep threat. I think the, the one thing he can do is stretch the field still. Um, you know, if you don't want to have him getting hit a lot, if you don't want to have him have to cut a lot, he's not a big route runner to begin with, uh, but he is still the fastest guy on that team. So I think if he plays, you're going to see him stretch the field. Same thing with Clyde Edwards Hilaire. He, he's a different kind of runner than Isaiah Pacheco. Uh, or, or Jones. So I, I think if we see him, it becomes, you know, the latter end of the committee. Um, I don't think it will affect how the game goes. Uh, and, and frankly, I expect to see a lot more Pacheco just because as the season's gone on, I think Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy have learned Pacheco's the better blocker. And, and in a game where there is some questions about Mahomes' mobility, about blitz packages, uh, about the way the Bengals' defense has been playing over the last few weeks, uh, especially against the Chiefs a few weeks ago, uh, they are going to have to keep somebody in. So I think we're going to see a lot of Pacheco on play count, not as much on, on the run count. If uh, Miko Hardman is active in this game, I think the one area I might consider a bet is maybe like a, a quarter unit bet on him to score an anytime touchdown. You can get plus yep. 420 on him if you go to the prop finder tool at the lines.com. Before he got hurt, they were using him a lot near the goal line in some creative packaging where he had five touchdowns and three games before he got injured, including two rushing touchdowns near the goal line. So they're not afraid to use him in his speed in short area quickness situations. So uh, if we're getting four to one or better on him, I might sprinkle like a quarter unit on Nicole yeah. Hardman to, to find the end zone in this one. But I don't see him playing big snaps. It's not a situation where I want to play over his receptions or his rushing yards or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, maybe he gets in there, has a chance to, to break the goal line. Uh, and Clyde Edwards Hilaire, until they actually activate him, there's not even it's not even worth talking yeah. about any bets with him. He's he's nope. not even eligible to play until he is activated from IR. OK, uh, well, the Cincinnati Bengals, we talked about it last week. We talked about the offensive line injuries. I told you I wasn't 
convinced that they were going to have a big impact in the game. And sure enough, they didn't. And I'm not convinced they're going to have another big impact in this game with what the Chiefs put up with a front seven, even though Chris Jones is the number one rated interior defensive lineman by PFF. I'll get to that in a minute yeah. here, but it seems like it's trending towards status quo and these three starting offensive linemen are again going to be out this week. Yeah, sure looking that way. Uh, we, don't, we don't know for sure. Uh, you know, it went to the last minute, and I think they're going to do the same thing, You know, the so-called game time decision. Uh, so you'll know 90 minutes before, but I, I think we have a pretty good indication they're not. The other thing, you were dead on. You know, It did not affect the game. They played very physically. They, they dominated uh, the line play. I can't believe week. how well they ran the ball, to be honest with you. That shocked me. I, well, I think they simplified things. Uh, you know, going back and watching the game a second time, that was one of the things I was looking for is how did they do this? Did they just overplay them? Did, 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 did the scheme work? No, I just think they got physical. And if you're in this league, you've got a base level of talent. And if you're not asked to do too much, if you're not asked to pull and stunt and do the rest of it, if you're just asked to beat the guy in front of you, that becomes, you know, possible. Um, and, and, you know, second stringers, if, if you're just asked to basically mall block these guys, then, yeah, that can work. Uh, yeah, the other thing I think is, is this is one of the things that general managers don't get enough credit for is when those backups do perform, if you aren't having a, a drop off. I can remember a couple of years ago at the Combine talking to GM and he said, the thing I never want to do is have 20 percent drop off between players. You know, I want my backup to be competitive. I want him to be a 95% guy. And I don't want to have, you know, that third stringer uh, who might not necessarily be in, in a line position be, you know, 75%. That's just too much. He's not going to win. So I think uh, in a lot of these teams, but the Bengals especially, it's not that big a drop off to their backups. Obviously, Lyle Collins is on IR with the ACL tear. Yeah. Alex Kappa and Jonah Williams are still on the injury report, but back-to-back DMPs Wednesday and Thursday. Again, we'd be probably be shocked if, if they play this week. Yeah. Uh, Kappa with the ankle, Jonah Williams with the knee. If they win this week, then we'll see about the Super Bowl. That'll be a big storyline in the two weeks. That'll be a big it. difference because I think two weeks uh, will make a difference. You know, both of them were at least in consideration the last two weeks, which tells me you know maybe they weren't close, but – closer two weeks, I think could make a big difference. There was some concern going into the practice week with a fourth starter on that offensive line, their center, Ted Karras, but back to back full participant Wednesday yeah. and Thursday with a knee injury. Any concern there at this point? No, no, uh, it was the same thing last week. Uh, and he played and he played well. Uh, again, I think they simplified things. Uh, there wasn't a ton of pulls or stunts. So I think we basically got to read this like we did last week. Last note, tight end Hayden Hurst popped up on the injury report, a midweek yeah. addition to the injury report, which is never a good sign. Not sure how much it impacts this this game because they have a ton of weapons, but it's at least notable here, Will, whenever somebody pops up midweek. Exactly. He he injured his calf. Uh, a, a mild calf strain was the word from the Bengals, uh, but it happened on Thursday. Uh, so it's a new injury. This isn't something he's been carrying, at least nothing that's that's been listed. Uh, the fact that he, he is on the injury report tells me it's a concern. It's one I'm going to be checking You know, w when the active lineups come out 90 minutes before. Uh, that's one because I do think uh, even though Hurst hasn't put up the big numbers some expected from him uh, coming in, uh, he is something of a safety blanket. He's a very good blocker. Um, he's especially useful down in the red zone. Uh, if nothing else, he's a big pick. I know that doesn't help uh, gamblers a whole lot, but it's one of those things where I think for Burrow, it's going to be more important that he's out there than anything else. Yeah, I'm checking real quick to see if his receiving numbers are still on the board at these sports books, considering, yeah, Hayden Hurst is still on the board uh, for props right now, despite the midweek addition to the injury report. Sometimes this happens when you get to this point in the season and the books are throwing out as many offerings yeah. as possible. And um, typically some, something like this might get pulled off the board or not even listed in the middle of the season. But at this point in the year, everything's available at the sports book. So 34 and a half is the line on his receiving yards with him battling an injury now midweek. You know, I would never take the over at this point with an injury midweek, but I think it's at least something people should consider looking at Hayden Hurst unders uh, if he's now battling 
an injury after being added to the the report. Um, two playoff games this year, 59 yards, 45 yards. So that number is well below what it was. But um, during the regular season, if you look at the last five weeks of the regular season, he was under 36 yards for the past five games. So um, just something to keep in mind there. Something, you know, maybe you guys can think about if you want to bet or not. I'll leave it up to you guys. I just thought about it at this point. Don't really have a bet. But uh, the one angle here I want to talk about, Will, is the fact that I don't think this offensive line is going to be affected again for a second yeah. straight week for the Bengals. And I think it's because despite having Chris Jones, Kansas City was dead last this season in run stop win rate. So I think the Bengals might be able to run the ball again. And they were only 15th in pass rush win rate, win rate were the Chiefs. A lot of now that kind of flies in the face of another website, uh, Pro Football Reference, that has their own pressure stats that had the Chiefs among the top 10 in pressure rate. But they also were getting pressure about the same percentage as they blitz. So there's mm -hmm. some correlation there. And I'm not sure Joe Burrow is somebody you want to blitz and leave his receivers in one on one coverage on the backside. So uh, I say all this to conclude that I think points are going to be scored in this game. And yeah. if you look at the last three games between these two teams dating back to last year, the rosters are very similar. And obviously we have a late season game to go by as well. All three of those games had an over under in the fifties. And as we record right now, Friday morning, there's still a 47 at the board at Caesar Sportsbook. A couple yeah. of the other books have ticked up to 48. I still think that's too low. Yeah. If Mahomes is at least 80%, like you're saying, and the offensive line isn't going to be as in as much of a downgrade as a lot of people think. This this over under has to start with a five. So I ran and bet yeah. over 47 at Caesars. I dropped it in our discord. Join our discord if you haven't. But yeah, I, I'm I'm all on the over on this one. Yeah, same here. Uh, that, that was where I went uh, with my bet this week, because I think what's going to happen early is that the Bengals are going to try to do what they did last week, which is run, run, run. And look, Andy Reid is, is nothing if not a prepared coach. He's going to know what they did, what succeeded. They're going to try to stop that. And if they stop it early, then Burrow's got to start passing. And that turns the game into a shootout. I don't think that's good for the Bengals, but I think that's certainly good for an over. As far as the spread, it's it's been extremely interesting to have a, a championship game with this much line movement. Opened KC minus three, got beaten to oblivion, went all the way to Cincinnati minus two and a half. Now the limits are higher, closer to kickoff, and we're back to KC minus one, minus one and a half. Just keep in mind that a lot of books, a lot of sharp bettors basically had the Chiefs and the Bills with an equal rating at late in the season. So if the Bengals were plus six at Buffalo just last week, then it is quite the departure if Mahomes is going to be functional to be less than a three point favorite this week. Now I rejected yeah. that six points was a, a bad line last week. I mean, so even if you thought the line should have only been four, that's still a big downgrade for Mahomes. If you're mm -hmm. now having the chiefs less than a three point favorite in this game. So it's always yeah. an interesting exercise for me. It's there's no science to this. It's a matter of opinion of how impactful you think it is. But I think anything under three here with Kansas City is at least a discount unless we are continuing to severely, uh, you know, handicap the Bengals incorrectly at this point. Will that's also a possibility yeah, as well. Definitely. But, yeah, I, I agree with you 100 percent there. All right. Let's move forward here with the NFC championship game between the Philadelphia Eagles hosting the San Francisco 49ers. Unlike the AFC title game like no line movement most of the week this week. This yeah. got to two and a half for the Eagles. It's been sitting there for days now. We'll, it's juiced, so I guess we'll see if this touches three. And I think some of that might be contingent on the injury report here with the San Francisco 49ers. Well, we'll get to Jalen Hurts in a moment, but Christian McCaffrey, Eli Mitchell, the top two running backs for the 49ers, and Debo Samuel all nursing injuries this week. Eli Mitchell's the only one I'm really concerned that might not play. McCaffrey told the media zero chance that he misses this game. You're confident in, in your report that Debo Samuel's going to play, but um, how limited do you think these guys might be? That's going to be the question. You know, Eli Mitchell with the groin, it's going to be really tough. He didn't practice on Thursday. Uh, I have some questions about how effective he's going to be. 
And the, going back to last week, I think we saw something on McCaffrey with the usage that we had of Mitchell. They were basically using McCaffrey as a third down back. And they didn't use Debo Samuel as a runner as much as they have in the past. I think that's because they've got McCaffrey. Mitchell was being effective until he was hurt. McCaffrey wasn't. And going back and watching it, uh, you know, they kept saying that the defense was holding McCaffrey back. Uh, I got to I got to think Tony Romo was Romoing that one. Uh, I mean, you've been saying for look. weeks that you've had wear and tear concerns with McCaffrey. This is not a yeah. new thing that you've been talking no. about. No, no. It's patellar tendonitis. He's got a lot of inflammation in that knee. It's a maintenance thing. The 49ers have been doing a very good job of getting him ready week to week. And this is the one week. This is the thing you have to keep in mind with the playoffs. For the Eagles, they've only got to play one one week game. They had the bye. They come in. Yeah, the 49ers haven't had that rest uh, so I, I do think the wear and tear is going to be more that buy is important. And then, of course, if you go to the Super Bowl, you get that bonus week uh, to, to rest and, and do everything before you have to you know, <laughs> go through all the, the hoops that you do in, in Super Bowl media week. Uh, for McCaffrey, I am worried about how much he's going to be able to go. They limited him so much last week. That tells me he's not going to be out there for more than 20, 25 plays. So they're going to have to pick it. And if that's the case, they've got to use Debo Samuel more. Are you going to use Brock Purdy and have him throw 40 times? If so, that feels like it's playing right into uh, the the uh, Eagles defensive scheme. Uh, you know, I just don't see a way that uh, they get through without forcing Purdy to do more than you really want. <laughs> you know, certainly not a third string, uh, Mr. Irrelevant uh, you know, quarterback who's only played half a season. As good as that's been, you don't want to overstress him. I wouldn't have wanted to overstress Garoppolo. Uh, Trey Lance would have been in the same situation, uh, certainly a different player. But, uh, you know, if, if they have to throw 35, 40 times, they're in trouble. I think the 49ers want to run, want to run the ball in this game. I think they want to run it a lot. And... Yeah. The matchup dictates that the Eagles, even in games where Jordan Davis, their big, strong, wide rookie has been in the interior of that defensive line, they have been below average in rush EPA defense and rush success rate defense, even in the span when he came back from injury towards the back end of the year. And they added the two guys off the street, including in Dominican Sue. It just went from like, among the worst to just being below average. And now you're facing an elite rushing team in the San Francisco 49ers. So I think they want to run the ball here, but if McCaffrey's dinged up and if Eli Mitchell doesn't play, then we need to look at Debo Samuel rushing props here. If that's the case, Uh, maybe even Jordan Mason rushing. I was just about to say that. Yeah, Yeah. I was looking for Jordan Mason props earlier this week and they weren't up. Uh, I haven't checked uh, later in the week. It was one of those. I'm going to check it on Sunday morning once we have a better handle on, on whether Mitchell's going to play. But yeah, I, I think Mason is going to have to. He he had I think uh, around ten snaps, uh, so he was obviously out there. Uh, and uh, like you said, uh, they want to run the ball. Somebody's got to run the ball. Uh, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not saying Mason's going to do something big, but that that's a good line. They can they can move things. And like you said about the Eagles, they'll, I don't want to say bend, not break, but they'll give up some yards. It's yeah. not like they're going to you know, rock solid run defense, um, though they're pretty good. So, yeah, I think Mason on that. I'm worried about Samuel, uh, not in the fact that he won't play, but again, how much can they run him? You know, he's not really a between the tackles guy, but you know, how much wear and tear can he take uh, between between Samuel and and McCaffrey, I think they've got what, 25, maybe 30 carries at the outside, uh, and they're going to need more than that. Yeah, the only prop up I'm seeing right now for Jordan Mason is an anytime touchdown, which hey, m- might be worth some lunch money here. 12 to 1 at a couple of different books. If you go to the Prop Finder tool under the odds tab at thelines.com, that's a little interesting. Debo Samuel does have props up. Um, I know you're concerned, but I'll just mention what the numbers are. The rushing props, 20 and a half is the lowest number right now with minus 115 juice. 
Uh, he had four carries against Dallas for 11 yards, so he was mostly stopped in that role. Against yeah. Seattle, three carries for 32 yards, including a, a long of a 22-yard run. On the season, he had one, two, three, five games with more than 20 yards. So, But I, I'm betting most of those came before McCaffrey was there. Uh, you, you, well, there's uh, a couple early season, but there were, yeah, three of them from November and later where he had 20 yeah. plus yards. So it's, it's split, but I think you're uh, mostly right there. He, he has not yeah. seen nearly the amount of rushing work that we saw in last postseason, right? Yeah. Where he was frequently getting 40 plus yards in a yeah. lot of these games where he was, you know, exactly. and, and getting goal line touchdowns as well. We might see a little bit more of that if he's healthy enough, because I think they'd probably trust Debo Samuel in the NFC championship game in the backfield more than they would Jordan Mason. But, you know, yeah, I, I think what we've seen is it, after they got McCaffrey, Samuel became more of a gadget, big play guy right. rather than, a you know, we're, it's a standard second and the seven. reality is he just moves them all over the formation yeah. right because he could put yep. samuel in the backfield mccaffrey out wide so he's just mixing it up constantly to confuse the defense exactly exactly so uh i, I think he's going to play i think he'll be fine i'm just worried about the wear down effect uh that hip uh and, and mccaffrey with his knee and now the ankle and, and, and the 49ers have had a lot of injuries yep. they've overcome them i think that's one of the things that teams don't get credit for, uh, you know, certainly you want to prevent injuries, but then when somebody gets hurt, you want them to come back. Or when you have a guy like McCaffrey, who you have to maintain, uh, the Panthers weren't able to for the last couple of years. And they realized that and said, let's get some value for him. Uh, and certainly I think both sides like that trade right now. All right, let's wrap up with the two most significant injuries on the Philadelphia Eagles. Now I say injury, but Jalen Hurts is not on the injury report, but he also didn't have to get hit against the Giants. Yeah. He had a very easy matchup. They basically got to rest him while playing him in that game. Yeah. Uh, if he takes a hit, how concerned are you? Is this truly the real test at this point? Or do you think he's healthy at this point? He's relatively healthy, but it, when he takes a hit, what he has is an SC joint sprain. It is not healed. Uh, he is not taking a painkiller for it. Uh, but when he takes a hit, when he lands on either shoulder, that's going to compress and the sternum has to move just a little bit. Uh, that's going to hurt. That's all it is. Is it, it, It's a pain tolerance issue. He hasn't had any trouble with his biomechanics where he gets his arm out of slot. Uh, this is just you don't want him taking a lot of big hits. But, yeah, that's kind of true for – every quarterback in every game. So I'm not overly worried about Hurts. I'm, I'm certainly more worried about Lane Johnson, uh, who played like Lane Frost in terms of pain tolerance. He has a, a nearly ruptured groin uh, adductor muscle. So the adductor muscle, they bring your legs together. If you remember the, that old machine where you, you had to push your legs together in, in a V, that's, that's the muscle you're, you're testing here. So you think about that. Just to be stable, he's got to be able to hold his legs in position, to slide from side to side the way he has to in pass protection. I don't know how he's doing it, but he's doing it. Somebody said, oh, you just shoot him up. You can't shoot up a groin and expect somebody <laughs> to stand. Uh, that's ridiculous. It's like people saying, shoot up Mahomes. You can't run around with a numb foot. That's just not going to work. <laughs> You know, at, at, at best, these guys are probably taking, you know, a handful of Advil uh, and anti-inflammatories aren't really going to help a, a muscle that is hanging by a thread. This is virtually the same injury that Joey Bosa had earlier in the season where they had to reattach it. Uh, his was at the tendon. This is in the middle of a muscle. Um, you know, so next time you get a steak, uh, cut the steak, now stitch it back together. That's what the surgeons are going to have to do for him. And he had he had a surgery scheduled on Tuesday. He's got another s scheduled for Tuesday, but he's hoping he gets to cancel it because uh, he's not going to have it until after the season and hopefully uh, for him, not till after the Super Bowl parade. I don't have a strong opinion on this game, to be honest with you. I think the line is correct. I yeah. have I have concerns that the Eagles have been playing an easy schedule to get to this point, had the easiest possible path to get to this point. And now they have to face one of the, the four best teams that we've had graded as such all season long. But I also have concerns about 
Brock Purdy going on the road in the loudest environment that he may ever play in and the injuries on the 49ers as well. So I think the line is right. We'll see if Matt Brown or Adam Candy on the Megapod have a a bigger opinion of that. You can find that on our YouTube channel or in our podcast feed this weekend. Uh, But that Lane Johnson injury is one I'm going to be watching very closely to see if against this defensive line of the 49ers, if it comes back to haunt them and they get pressure on Jalen Hurts on that on that right side of the line. So, yeah, uh, Will, any final thoughts here? You know, I, I'm so intrigued by both of these teams. You know, it's it's not really a gambling thing, but the fact that, you know, with a third string quarterback, now they're going to have to make some decisions. You know, Garoppolo is going to be a free agent, so they're not going to get any value for him, uh, though certainly they did to get him to this point. You know, what are they going to do? You know, does Brock Purdy just go back to being the best backup in, in the league? Do they trade him? Uh, there's so many things they can do. On the other side, I think the Eagles aren't getting nearly enough credit. Remember, this is a team that was a Super Bowl champion not that long ago. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't that long after that that Doug Peterson got shown the door. And they brought in Nick Sirianni, a young guy who surprised a lot of people. And they've built this team back up, both on the field uh, and on the roster. Howie Roseman deserves a lot of credit. Think how quickly they both fell apart and rebuilt to a Super Bowl contender again. I think that's absolutely amazing. Uh, and when you take a look at some of these teams that have been rebuilding for 20 years, high Cowboys fans, uh, it, it's one of those that I think you have to give a ton of credit for, and I think it's going to be a very, very interesting offseason for some teams. That's cold-blooded, man. They just got eliminated last week, but you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. And now Mike McCarthy's not giving job security to his offensive coordinator despite him making the – the decisions on the sideline to go for it or not. So typical Cowboys stuff. I'm sure the fans down there are frustrated and you're right. You know, Howie Roseman executive of the year by far in the NFL. Yep. So, and the Eagles somehow Nick Sirianni, somehow not a finalist for coach of the year, which just boggles my mind. It's like they, people forget that this was a team that was not projected to win double digit wins this year coming into the season and they get the one seed. So um, I think Sirianni got robbed on that award, but Voters like the new hotness in the second half of the year. And, and yeah, not, it wasn't that long ago that people said Jalen Hurts needed to be a tight end. Yeah, there you go. Wild. All right. Best of luck to everybody with your bets this week. For Will Carroll, I'm Steven Andress. Enjoy the football, and we will see you before the Super Bowl.